It all depends what you mean, is the popular stereotype of a philosopher's response to almost any serious question. A very irritating response it often is. Philosophers are regularly accused, sometimes even by other philosophers, of attending too much to words and what they mean, when they should be attending to the serious things that words stand for. Ask a philosopher for details of the good life, for example, and what you're apt to get instead is a disquisition on the meaning of the word good, or of the word life, or even, if the philosopher's on form, of the word the. What on earth is the use of that, other people not unnaturally ask. What do philosophers think they're doing? Don't they understand their own language, that they spend their time trying to sort out what these really very commonplace words mean? Or do they think they're uncovering or inventing nuances of meaning, to which most people are oblivious? But how, for a start, could that be? Since words mean what they used to mean, how can words mean things their users know nothing about? And even if they could be made to mean such things, what would that have to do with what ordinary people actually mean when they talk normally? In fact, people can mean things they don't mean to mean. And there can be a point, even a very practical, non-philosophical point, to teasing out niceties of meaning. Let me take an example. A man is dead, we say. What do you mean, dead? the philosopher asks. Well, for one thing, various things follow from the fact of a man being dead, as we all know, to many of which great exception would be taken otherwise, not least by the man himself. His belongings can be handed over to his more or less sorrowing relatives. His body can be dumped in a plot of earth or turned into a neat pile of ashes. That these rather drastic things can be done when a man dies is part of what the word dead means. It's the part that makes it very important to be quite sure one is right in pronouncing a man dead and thereby setting off these consequent processes. But this isn't the part of the meaning that enables you to tell whether someone is dead. You can't tell that by looking to see if it's all right to bury or cremate him or to hand over his property to other people. On the contrary, you can only settle those questions by looking to see if he's dead. So what death is, that is what the word dead means, must also include something else, some rules for telling when the word applies, when a man really is dead. Some of the rules we all know, of course. Has he stopped breathing? Has his pulse stopped? And so on. But these rules are not conclusive, as we also know. A man may recover from having stopped breath or a stopped heart. What will show that these things not only have stopped, but are going to stay stopped? That's a tricky question. A question for medical experts, a question, as they say, of defining clinical death. So although most of us may know well enough the part of its meaning that has to do with the consequences of a man being dead, there may well be scope for expert argument over the other part, the part that fixes just how to tell in unobvious cases that he is dead. But surely in that case the experts are the medics. Who needs philosophy? You certainly need something that medical expertise does not itself supply, although doctors may well have it. Granted, medics are professionally expert at describing a human organism in great detail, but that leaves the question of which bits of their description what features of the human body are relevant to deciding whether a man may properly be buried in the ground or incinerated or have his goods passed on to others, which is what follows from his being properly called dead. And that isn't just a medical question, as one can see by looking at the case of people kept going after serious brain damage, say, in a completely inert or vegetable state. Are they alive or are they dead? It's a serious question. But assuming there's no possibility of their being further revived, no more merely medical data is going to decide it. It's a philosophical question about what the word dead means, or should be made to mean. That doesn't mean it's just a trivial matter of words. It's still a very practical question whether this man is dead, whether his body and belongings can rightly be disposed of. Only in this case, the answer does depend on what you mean by dead. So, how does a philosopher set about answering it? Define your terms, is the usual irritated cry of hard-headed philosophical amateurs. Define clinical death. Tell me what you mean by dead, and I'll tell you whether this man is dead or not. It's not that easy, unfortunately. 
serious philosophical questions can hardly ever be settled by definitions, as I hope to show next week. Of course, it does all depend what you mean by definition. I remarked last week that the philosopher's much derided caveat, it all depends what you mean, sometimes has a very practical significance. But if a question, practical or merely philosophical, turns on what some word means, whether the word be dead or intelligent or democratic or beautiful, how are such things decided? By definition is the short, stock and unsatisfactory answer I alluded to last time. If only people would define their terms, I find it repeatedly said or politely implied, then philosophical quibbling, the needless obfuscation of basically plain issues, could be put a stop to, and philosophers, no doubt, set to earn their living in more useful ways. Anyone who really thinks that should try it the next time they have a serious argument. Take arguments about intelligence, for example, about whether there are racial differences in it, or whether especially intelligent or especially unintelligent children should be educated differently from the rest. Arguments like this are almost certain to depend at crucial points on what the parties mean by the word intelligent. Suppose they try to settle that by defining their terms. Ability to get an above average score in a standard IQ test, says the hard-headed party. That's what I mean by intelligent. Life isn't a matter of passing IQ tests, says his opponent, very reasonably, if not entirely to the point, and he declines to accept the definition. Every definition, it has been well said, conceals an axiom. In the present case, that someone who is good at IQ tests is also good at the rather vague range of activities which we use in everyday life to assess people's intelligence. That's what's in dispute between the parties. And it's a matter of fact, not of definition. It can't be settled one way by defining intelligence to mean what IQ tests measure. But nor can it be settled the other way, just by rejecting that definition and coming up with a rival one. If the answer to a serious question turns on which of two definitions is to be adopted, the disputants will simply turn the dispute into one about which is the right definition. The appeal of definition, as a method of clearing up and settling arguments, lies in the idea that we can define words how we like. After all, they are our words. Surely, like Humpty Dumpty, we can use them to mean what we want them to mean. The trouble with that idea is that we is not I. The we, whose usage fixes what words mean, is the great mass of English speakers. And neither you nor I nor even the editor of the Oxford English Dictionaries, as one or two solitary members of that mass can decide by definition that a word like intelligent or dead shall mean something different from what everyone else means by it. We obviously can't make intelligent mean stupid or dead mean alive. And no more, just by definition, can we make intelligent mean good at IQ tests or dead mean lacking in cerebral activity. We can, within bounds that common usage for the time being sets, extend, refine, make more precise the meaning of words like intelligent or dead. And as I suggested last week, there may be urgent practical reasons for doing so. But even then, it can't be done just by elaborating definitions. We can't just arbitrarily stipulate some medical test to settle doubtful cases of life and death nor use just any arbitrary psychological puzzle to settle doubtful cases of intelligence. There must be evidence that these tests at least give the right answer in the obvious cases, and that they relate to what we know of the mechanisms of life on the one hand, and of intelligence on the other. And the evidence for all that may be, it is, incomplete and debatable, and ideas of what these mechanisms are highly controversial. That's why there is serious argument about these matters, argument which is indeed in part about what the words dead and intelligent mean. But the arduous processes of getting more evidence and of developing ideas that can make sense of the evidence can't be short-circuited by stipulation. It would be nice if they could. The dream of something for nothing 
of perpetual motion is a perpetual dream. And in philosophy, it takes the form of the fallacy that freely stipulated definitions can settle arguments about what words mean.